So what we're going to talk about primarily is video backhaul and not only across private networks but also across the internet. And again, really excited to be able to be here since QVC is a client of ours who is using this application. So we can talk firsthand about that. And Dave will be doing some demonstration, showing some different stuff. For example, on the screen here right now, he's showing the actual show, the broadcast that is going up out to the internet to a media gateway and back down. And this is the actual broadcast that we watch at home. So he'll going to talk about that and show some statistics. <clears throat> So what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk a little bit about High Vision. High Vision is not a household name. Uh, we're going to talk about our history, a little bit about us, talk about the application for backhaul, talk about our streaming solutions and live demo and then of course Q&A. And I'm the sales guy. They said you got to show at least a dozen PowerPoint slides if we're going to buy dinner. So I got to do that. But Dave's going to do the live demo. No, I'm going to make the PowerPoint as brief as possible. So High Vision, our mantra is helping people work better with video. Whether it's helping people publish video to websites, like a YouTube type site, whether it's helping people stream live across the internet, or moving video from point A to point B. We work in very specific applications to help people become more efficient with their video. And more and more people are using video, whether it's in the consumer space or the enterprise space. <clears throat> and these applications, streaming, recording, management, and delivery. A little bit about us. We have been uh, selected as the Stream Media Magazine's Reader Choice Awards. I think 2014 was our most recent award. That was for our Makito Wax Encoder. Makito Wax Encoder that we're going to talk about are these little gray boxes that are stacked up here that feel free to take a look at those and pass them around. They're not take homes, those are actual units, but we'll talk about those. And then our High Vision Video Cloud. We won an award for that. High Vision Video Cloud is really an end to end solution for internet delivery from your source all the way to the viewer on an iPhone, iPad, Roku, Xbox, or whatever it is. We have a complete workflow for that. We are headquartered in Montreal, and we've been recognized by Deloitte for the past number of years for the Fast 500, which is a technology growth award in Canada. And then our clients have gone on to win many awards using our solutions. Uh, IBC is one of the recognizing groups there. <clears throat> So we design our products around intelligent media management, largely around high performance and low latency streaming solutions. You know, the intelligent media management, that applies to our IPTV products. We do digital signage. We also do, of course, internet delivery in the backhaul. And the underpinning of these solutions is a technology that we call SRT, Secure Reliable Transport. We're going to talk a lot more about that later on. The verticals that we work in are up here on the screen. Obviously, um, you know, QVC falls in the enterprise and sports and broadcast. We help them both with the internal corporate communication stuff, but of course, moving the broadcast around. We do other things in other applications. In medical, we do a lot of bi-directional telesurgery, telemedicine. In the federal military space, we move video over constrained networks, sometimes you know, from in theater to you know, where decision makers are and stuff like that. These are the verticals in which we play. An example of one of our clients is NBC Sports. So Dave, maybe I'll add a little bit of color to the commentary as he goes up to Connecticut quite a bit to deal with NBC. It's not my client, it's Dave's and his colleague Scott's. But NBC is a client we've helped for the past three years for the past three Olympics that they've broadcast. Our application is doing backhaul from the venues and then also redistribution within their uh, broadcast facilities, NBC Sports. So they'll do the backhaul from whether Winter Olympics or Summer Olympics, and then they'll redistribute that across their networks, plus also do contribution to air using our products, doing it with the Makito product line that we're going to be talking about. Anything else you want to say about NBC? I don't know, you got it. Spot on. All right. Another one of our clients, uh, NHK, which is actually a Japanese broadcaster, they came to us, I think it was earlier this year, and they had an application where they wanted to deliver bi-directional video over KA band satellite and the internet. The application was they had a medical conference that they wanted to do a live surgery demonstration for this medical conference from one of their ORs in Japan. So we implemented the technology that we're gonna to show tonight an encoder decoder pair at each end and we're able to send low latency video over satellite and over the internet so they could hold this bi-directional surgery at the conference. It's pretty unique. A couple other of our clients are on the screen here. 
I apologize, I didn't put QVC's logo up here, but it certainly should be up here. We do many different applications for these clients, whether it's doing backhaul or internal delivery across our networks or streaming to the internet. These are just a couple of examples of clients who are looking for video delivery and backhaul solutions. So what is this broadcast backhaul? The first application is aggregation of streams. So what we're seeing many clients with the need to do is to bring in multiple streams from remote venues or contribution sources over a public network connection and then aggregate those together. So Dave's gonna demonstrate how the Makito X encoder can take a HDSDI, HDMI signal. It'll turn that into this technology called SRT that I mentioned earlier, a stream that's designed to run across the internet. And then that's delivered to a box, a media gateway, that then can turn that stream into a standards-based stream that can get delivered across the network and be watched on set-top boxes or on desktop computers or even go to mobile devices. So that's one application this media gateway handles. The second application is kind of the reverse. And we have broadcasters that are using it for this application now, which is low latency contribution to multiple affiliates. So in that application, we've got a single source or multiple sources coming into an encoder. That same SRT streams going across the internet to a media gateway, where then we're gonna simultaneously send out tens or hundreds of streams simultaneously to other receiving decoders over the internet. So now, a remote affiliate who's doing a broadcast from the latest you know, XYZ thing can send up a single stream to a media gateway and now all your remote affiliates can have this simultaneously and be putting it to air or using it wherever they need to. So that's an example that we're having a lot of traction with right now. And the underpinnings of this is this SRT, Secure Reliable Transport. So, Rick, do you have a question? Okay. Um, has anyone tried to push a stream across the internet in low latency, high definition? Okay. And what type of success did you have? It was decent? Okay. I'm curious what it was, but generally for low latency people use what's called a UDP stream. A UDP stream is where the encoder just spits out packets, just sends out packets with no recognition of what the decoder is. The decoder, if there's any type of latency in the network, any jitter, any type of network interference that doesn't allow those packets to arrive in a certain order, the screen won't look really good. So what we've done with SRT is taken and optimized the communication between the decoder and the encoder so that when it's spitting out those packets, the decoder actually knows what the encoder is doing, the encoder knows what the decoder is doing, and if it misses some packets, the encoder retransmits them. But it's different than just doing you know, a complete retransmission of the entire stream so that you would double your bandwidth. It only sends those packets necessary. So basically, it lets people use the public internet that's unmanaged to do low latency delivery at a very low cost. <clears throat> And this is kind of how it works. So it accounts for, as I said, this packet loss, jitter, latency, and fluctuating bandwidth. So the encoder decoder, which Dave's gonna demonstrate here, they make a call between the two through the firewalls to establish this connection. Then after that connection has been made, they simply will start to, oops, I guess it already animated. They'll start to push that video right through the firewall over standard ports. Okay, so what makes it work? That Makito. The Makito are these encoders that we have here on the table. We've got two versions. The encoder has the, the full BNC on it and these little mini connectors, that's the decoder. So this is a two channel HDSDI encoder. So two independent channels of video and then we're gonna connect it to the network and it gets power. Then you can either embed the audio on the HDSDI or it has a separate analog audio input. So this particular appliance can just sit on a rack or whatever you want. It also can mount in a 4U enclosure, so we can get 21 of these stacked side by side in four rack units, so they can do 42 channels. And we also have a little one rack unit version that you can get six of them side by side, so you can do 12 channels. So you take your video in, and it's just gonna come out across the network, and then it will go to a decoder, in many cases, like we're gonna demonstrate, and then the decoder will come out HD SDI, or it'll come out HDMI. Plus it also can retransmit a uh, multicast or unicast stream, so not only can you watch it on a, a monitor, but you can also then transmit it across the network on a, uh, to watch on desktops or something like that. 
So very high performance. It also has this four encoding cores. What that means is we can send out multiple bit rates, multiple resolutions of the stream. Many clients say, I need a full 1080p to go to a large, large screen like this, but I only need 720 to go to a smaller desktop. So you can set multiple versions of your streams in that encoder. And then the media gateway. So the media gateway is uh, a, an appliance, and we have one that's hosted that Dave's going to use today for the demonstration. But what this box will do is it takes in SRT or takes in transport stream, and it can flip those and then also multiply the number of streams coming in. So it can aggregate those streams, like one of my first slides. We have multiple encoders coming into the media gateway, or it can replicate those streams, bring in single streams and then send them out. It really helps the system to scale. All right, so why is this important? Well, I think you, you mentioned in the beginning that more and more people are demanding content. More video on the internet, more video going to air. So people want more content, but it's at a cost. Traditionally, the way people have delivered video, and the way many people still do today, is either over an MPLS circuit, so a private network connection that you can have quality of service on. Because going back to that UDP stream, if you don't have a quality of service that you can implement on the network, those packets are just flowing out there, and the, re the decoder isn't going to receive them correctly. So if you have an MPLS circuit, you can tag those packets so they arrive in the right order. They would either use MPLS or they'd use satellite. Here are some examples of the cost of each of those, and they might be hard to see, but MPLS circuits might run one, two, three, five thousand dollars a month where the demonstration that we're showing today, we're using a straight up business class connection from Comcast that maybe cost $200 a month or something like that. And satellite you know, is really good, but it has a cost associated with it as well. So that's it for my slides. What happens when there are errors on the network? Absolutely. So with using that SRT protocol, the decoder talks to the encoder and it sends or has those packets resend to recover. So what we can do is we can build in a different buffer level on the decoder based upon how much network congestion or how much network you know error there is. And Dave will talk about that and show that on the demo. Okay, Dave, you're up. Right. So we have you seen with the Mikito X uh, encoder and decoder? What we have here in the setup is we have the uh, SDI feed that's uh, the original uh, source material that we're seeing here, tuned in here. We have a Makito X encoder, so similar that we have on the desk there, is sitting right here. So it's receiving that video stream. Uh, sorry, not video stream. It's receiving that SDI, uncompressed 1080i 2997. And from there, we're compressing it. So low, it's an H.264 low latency encoder. So it's compressing that video stream. It's sending out what we call this SRT protocol, which effectively is a transport stream with additional encryption and error recovery. And so it's sending out that SRT stream onto the network. And from there, um, we're actually sending that stream to a media gateway. It's kind of like, think of it as a reflector. So it's receiving this SRT uh, at our Montreal headquarters. And from there, we're sending back that SRT stream to a decoder. So think of it as going out onto the internet. So we're using that Verizon, that public Verizon line, a public internet line, going across the uh, going across the internet to Montreal and then back down uh, using that same Verizon line to come in. Uh, so that SRT stream is coming in to the decoder now and then being flipped out uh, SDI and HDMI. And we have that HDMI plugged into this screen here. So you can see that the we're maintaining uh, low latency, so in that you can see it's about sub sub second uh, latency as we compare the two screens. Right, so this is the the output coming from the from the decoder across the internet. So going up to Montreal, back down. We're encrypting it AES 256 bit encryption. So we're encrypting that video uh, to ensure that because we're going over the public internet, if anyone wants to, you know, snoop in, listen to that to those streams, they can't. They won't be able to actually see what's going on uh, with that content. So if you want to secure that content, we're doing that with uh, AES 256-bit. And we're also uh, maintaining that low latency. So when we see um, packet loss, and as we're kind of, this is a, a live uh, real-time statistics coming from the media gateway. We can also look at it on the encoder side and decoder side. But looking at it from the media gateway's perspective, 
we're having, and it's hard to read on the screen, but we have a round trip time, a retransmission rate, and a packet loss rate, and, and drop packets. Actually, it's pretty clean at the moment. We've had some spikes, and actually, this uh, spike would actually indicate that the, uh, the errors that were happening during the transmission exceeded the buffer. We probably, this might have, this might have uh, shown a, a black screen at the time. In this case, kind of case, we would have this uh, increase, increase the buffers to uh, ensure that we were able to recover. So what happens for the recovery? If there are packet loss, like you have going over the internet, it's an unpredictable network, the, the decoder says, hey, I've missed packet three, five, and seven to the, to the encoder. And the encoder is keeping this buffer. And it will reach in its buffer and it will grab those missing packets and it will retransmit that to the decoder. And so the decoder is buffering before it outputs uh, outputs the video, it gets those new packets, it assembles the nice video signal, and it outputs uh, pristine, clear, quality video across the public internet. This works the same way over private network. Wow. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So whether you're pi private or public, uh, you, you're benefiting from the same type of technology. And it can handle up to, like, say, eight seconds of, uh, you know, you could actually literally pull the plug. Uh, Replug it back in, and you'd still see. You know, as long as the buffer has not uh, exceeded exceeded your threshold, you'll be able to still see great-looking video. Right. From here, I can uh, demonstrate, go into the actual web interfaces of the the encoder and decoder. Um, so do you want to do the side-by-side -side SRT? Sure. Actually, yeah, I can do the SRT. So what I'll show uh, what uh, video kind of side by side what video looks like between uh, a signal that has packet loss on it and what SRT is doing cleaning it up. So I'm just going to do some, uh, yeah, some cable changes. So what I'm doing now is I'm actually, I'll just take a step back here and logging into the, uh, the web interface of the encoder itself. And from our, our encoder, um, yeah, there we go, I'll just expand this a little bigger. Right, so we have a, a video stream, a video signal coming in to the video signal coming into the encoder. We can see uh, 1080i 2997. Right, we can see that video source that's coming in. We can actually drill down and set the bit rate that we want to. Uh, from here, I've set it. Uh, what I'm interested in, I'm going to go to the output. I'm going to turn on the turn on the stream. So I'm going to. Setting on uh, streams already going across the internet, but I'm going to send a, a multicast stream uh, just for my purposes of this test here. So I'm going to send a, a multicast stream. So this is a transport stream over UDP, right? So there's the SRT protocol, and there's also just a standard what we're familiar with, MPEG transport stream. So I'm sending a, a multicast transport stream, and I'm also sending a. Uh, I'm going to go to the decoder, and I'm also sending an SRT stream as well. Yeah, multicast transport stream. That's the one. Yeah, so we've 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 start, first implemented it in, on our encoder and decoder hardware products, and we're going to be rolling it out to other products. So we have InStream Mobile, which is a um, a mobile Android and iOS application, so we're able to receive those low latency video sub second to mobile devices. And we've also actually mo our most latest addition, we've added it to our Coolabyte products. So the Coolabyte products that we use to stream, there's a software based encoder and transcoder that we use here at QVC for streaming out to the internet like Flash and HLS, but now we've also, we can accept an SRT stream input. Uh, yeah, so we can actually, you know, you can cross the internet, send, a, send an, uh, from an encoder to, to a, a Coolabyte transcoder over SRT and be able to then f send uh, Flash and HLS. So we're, anyways, the short answer is we're adding it to more and more products. So it's available both ways. It's either available as an appliance 
or as a license that you can vertical box. Right, so what you can see on my screen right here, side by side, is that I have the, the transport stream. So this is the standard transport stream, and I'm uh, implementing, I'm kind of like simulating. So before, we were going over the public internet uh, with, uh, yeah, going over the public net with SRT. This is kind of simulating a public, uh, going over the public internet. So I'm simulating uh, packet loss here. I'm actually injecting, uh, injecting one, actually even, no, sorry, this is 2% packet loss. So we have 2% packet loss on a standard transport stream. So MPEG transport stream have no ability for uh, error recovery or resiliency over uh, any type of network. They're really designed for, uh, you know, private networks. So we can see that it's, you know, it's completely falling apart, you know, unwatchable or unusable. There's breakup, there's uh, macro blocking that are, is occurring. And here's the SRT side by side. So we see that, you know, there's no, none of those video hiccups, none of the freezing or pixelation that we're seeing. We're seeing the SRT uh, do its job. There's a little more latency in the SRT with that buffer. So it's got a slight buffer on the decoder to be able to retransmit those packets or the packets come back in. So why? Yeah. You said the buffer was eight seconds. Is that the maximum that you started at? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'd say eight. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, eight seconds is the, is the max buffer that you can set on it. Yeah. How long does it take for that information to go back to I need this and then come back again? Yeah, so this is why when we're saying to configure, um, to configure SRT, we say the, the round, we take the round, general as a rule of thumb, we'll take the round trip time, so the time it takes to get there and back. Uh, we say multiply that by four. So there's enough time for the encoder to tell the decoder, or sorry, the decoder say I have a problem to the encoder, and the encoder resend that, those packets out. So in this case, going, I don't want to show, this is over this LAN here, we have just one, one millisecond, so obviously it's very fast. But this is, this is going out from the, from the encoder up to Montreal, and that's 42 milliseconds. So we'd say take that, multiply that by four, and set that as your buffer. Uh, set that as, yeah, your latency buffer. I've set it to 125 milliseconds. But, so that gives it enough time to see that there's a problem, uh, make a request to the encoder for another packet, and the encoder send that packet, have enough time to actually put it back in the queue and output great looking video. Uh, what? Yeah, so exactly. So how do you determine the latency for, the, for a given link? That's a great question. So what you do is you, would, you could set up a stream, uh, and right away you'll see the RTT show up in the statistics, then you could modify it uh, accordingly. So, uh, or you could also just even monitor it. So you'd set up your first stream, uh, and if, you're, if your orange line is way below and you're having all these peaks going above it, then you would likewise uh, increase it to a number. If you wanted to ensure that you, know, you want to sacrifice latency and ensure that you always have great looking quality, you could set it at one second, set it at two seconds, if that's within your latency environment. You know, we have some customers that you know, low latency is absolutely important, so they're going to want to tweak that and ensure that it's as low, they can you know, get the buffer or the latency value as low as possible and still uh, looking at great looking video. Yeah, so, yeah. So the, the lowest latency we can set on there is 25 milliseconds. So on, an encoder to decoder is going to give you, let's say, 200 milliseconds, let's say a tabletop demo with a switch. That's 200 milliseconds. If you're going over the public internet and you want to add SRT, you know, assuming that it was, you know, there's a great connection, you could do it as low as 25 milliseconds uh, additional. So you'd, your end to end at that point would be 225. Yeah. Well, I mean, people are using this as live video, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. And so uh, one of those examples that, um, yeah, that uh, NBC Sports uses is that they have commentators that work from their home nowadays. And so they, they wanted to investigate the technology if they could be able to do transfer over the public internet. So commentator will have, celebrity commentator will have a Verizon business line, uh, sorry, Comcast uh, business internet just like they have here, but they, well, they say at their home, plug in the Mikito X encoder there, they're streaming that to uh, Stanford where they're all able to bring that into their uh, facility and, and have that 
two-way two -way, uh, interview with the conversation. So yeah, you can, it's being used currently for live video, definitely. As many as you want. Yeah. Yeah, so our, our media gateway, that, that product that I'm using to send and come back, another configuration uh, that I could actually open up a slide on is, is exactly that scenario. So uh, over here, na -na, na -na, say here. No, not that. Uh, we call it the, uh, the <laughs> so let's say you have, say you had previous generation high vision encoders that don't have, so this, this SRT technology is only on our Makito X, our latest and greatest encoder, but say you had previous generation encoders, or as you're saying, third party encoders, uh, you could put that here. So yeah, I was at, uh, where was I at? Uh, actually also NBC, uh, NBC Universal. They wanted to test out uh, their Cisco 90, uh, 9360, sorry, I forget the exact model of encoder, but it was giving me a transport stream. And I had actually this laptop running the media gateway uh, in a VM. So I, I received the transport stream. I sent it up to Montreal media gateway just as I am doing here. So imagine this is in Montreal. So this is my laptop. I SRTified their transport stream. I sent it to Montreal, sent the stream back down uh, to my media gateway on my laptop, flipped it out transport stream and it went into their Cisco DCM and they were able to then use it as they normally would. So yeah, you can take third-party transport streams. And that's really one of the beauties of SRT is that we're not, we don't even care what the codec is. It's a transport that is uh, independent of codec. So the transport stream that comes in and the timing information, the timing information that, like say, that decoder is expecting, maybe, like say, a Sencore or Fujitsu or whatever, their encoders and decoders are designed for each other. And if the timing information of that stream is off, then that decoder might show pixelation or jitter or what have you. And with SRT, we're taking in the packets as they're, as they're hitting, as, it's, um, as the encoder, yes, yeah, right here. As, as, the stream hits the, as the stream hits the media gateway, we're also looking at the, the packet order and the packet timing so that when we spit it out, uh, transport stream, we're putting it back on the wire just as we received it so that decoders, whatever's downstream decoder, um, we'll be able to uh, handle it just as if uh, this whole piece didn't exist and there was just a cable between that encoder to that decoder. Now with that said, we're not guaranteeing right now uh, uh, certifying uh, we, uh, just as far as because it is a, a new product we haven't certified with every single encoder decoder combination out there, but SRT uh, and from our tests so far uh, and customer uh, satisfaction with it, we're, you know, it seems like it's uh, I say transport stream or uh, encoder independent or agnostic. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. So all our all our products are H.264 and H.265. So the encoder, the Makitos here are H.264. What yeah. do you have multiple streams? Your let's say multiple cameras. Mm -hmm. Can you set the devices to? Uh, uh, yeah, so there's a there's a latent so you can't do a master thing. You, there's a, a latency value for each uh, for each stream. So you'd you'd set it equivalently to each of those uh, each of those video signals. What well, what is the use case that well, you're let's say you have a three camera down somewhere and you want to use three cameras, four cameras, you have mm -hmm. four channels that we're bring them back in. Yeah. So you'd, I would say you'd set you'd set the latency uh, to be. There's no master control. The, yeah. There's no master control. Uh, yeah. But definitely a good idea for future development. Yeah. As far as the bandwidth, what do we have up? We were setting the three meg up. Yeah. So actually, I'll, let me. That's a good thing to say. Is that I, I did a bandwidth test. Uh, oops. I did a bandwidth test. Uh, beforehand, so without any video going on, and so I saw that the the network connection. So this is a Comcast line. 
I could download 18 megs, which is great, but I could only upload 3.47 meg. So I was like, well, and I'm never going to, you know, I can't, the stream that I'm going to push out to the internet uh, up to Montreal, I won't be able to exceed that, uh, that limit. So I'll, you know, I'm stuck within that con confines of uh, 3.47 megabytes. So I've set the encoders to, to 3 meg and with uh, overhead and like SRT overhead and adding audio, we're at uh, about that, you know, that threshold. So I'm sending, uh, yeah, a three meg, actually I set it to 2.5 meg, um, yeah, 2.5, 2.5 megabit video. So it's a 1080i signal that uh, is uh, yeah, being streamed at 2.5 megabit. Uh -huh. That's low. That's, I mean, we ideally would like more. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, if we had, if we had more, we'd, we'd love more, and you'd be able to see, you know, we, if we're just doing a tabletop demo, uh, I could, you know, bump this up to 25 megabits. So the encoder itself uh, can go anywhere from 32K all the way up to 25 megabits per second. Um, and even just adding, you know, one or two more meg, you wouldn't get, you know, with those scene changes, you wouldn't have that. Uh, that pixelation that you have a 2.5 meg. There's just it's being bit starved, and there's just not enough. Uh, there's just not enough um, data to be able to resolve that at 2.5 meg. But you know the, what the encoder really shines at is really at low bit rates, and you can see you know doing you know kind of unheard of nowadays to do HD at 2.5 megabit, and we're doing you know it's uh, you know it's looking great. Uh, yeah, looking great at 2.5 meg. So I'll, I'll use that to just kind of uh, segue into the actual encoder itself. So I've, I've logged into the encoder, so I'm on the, the web interface of that encoder, and that's what we have up here. Um, I ideally like to start with video streams, and so it's a, what Brock showed, it has two SDI inputs. And inside of it, it has four encoding cores. So inside of there, there's four encoding cores, and you can do what you want with those encoding cores. So in this case, I have um, SDI, uh, yeah, so I've, SDI1, the BNC1, is coming in that, uh, the video signal that you know, we're, we're also mirroring up there. Uh, it also has a set, uh, and then we can then uh, set up those encoding cores. They could all be BNC1, and we could do different resolutions or different encoding profiles. Why would you want to do that? You might want to send a standard definition video stream out on the web, or you might want to send uh, a standard, maybe a multicast to lower powered PCs and an HD to set-top boxes if we were deploying, let's say, an IPTV uh, set-top box environment or signage. So you can really set the different quality levels as you want, um, uh, as, yeah, as you want for your t particular application. Because it has uh, two inputs, we can also have one input. Uh, we could do two different quality levels for uh, the two different inputs that we have there. Or we could set all four quality levels for a single input. So in this case, we have the 1080i 2997. Um, I've set the bit rate to 25 megabits per second, and when we drill down, we can set bit rate. The encoder itself can also actually um, deinterlace, so we can send a, a 720p. We can come in 1080i or send out a 720p. Um, we can also yeah, change frame rate if you want, uh, GOP size, IP framing, and other uh, other settings. All these settings take effect uh, immediately. So if I let's say put onto CABAC, which is actually going to get better quality. Uh, it's a little more latency, so let's say it adds on 30 milliseconds more, but it, it gets better quality at lower bit rates. So actually going over a 2.5 megabit stream, sending CABAC will get a little, will notice a little better quality on that side. Uh, you can set the audio, and here we go up to 16 channels of audio. So you can have 16 SDI uh, channels of audio coming in. Once I'm happy with the uh, audio and the video, I can put it all together. Um, and in this case, I've set the SRT, so I've set it the protocol that I want, set the video quality one I want. This is the 2.5 uh, 1080i signal where I'm going to. So in this case, I'm going to the uh, IP address uh, of the Montreal Media Gateway. I'm setting in my, my latency value, setting in my encryption, so I, it can be no encryption or AES 128 or 256 bit. Right? Put in my passphrase and Hit, a, hit start and I'm off to the races, the races. I can also, yeah, from the encoder itself, see a graph. So this shows me similar to uh, yeah, what we were seeing before. Maybe this is, yeah, that's good. Yeah, so you get, um, 
yeah, reconnections. Yeah, we can see recent packets. Uh, yeah, recent bytes. So we can see it's it's going it humming away and showing everything, uh, all the statistics uh, of what it's doing. I'm just wondering why it's doing that. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's cool. Uh, right. So from here, uh, I've also then say logged into the media gateway. Oh yeah, that's why. Yeah, so I'm actually messing. Yeah, that's why I forgot to do is. Yeah. So I'm actually shooting myself in the foot. I was sending a multicast stream on the uh, what is it called on the Comcast. Yeah. So I discovered earlier that the the Comcast router itself doesn't like any multicast. So when I send any multicast on the Comcast router, it uh, it messes everything up. So this should uh, correct itself, and should be good. Stream from Montreal. There you go. There we go. Nice green lights. So on the encoder side, let me just make this a little bigger. Yeah. So on the encoder side, it's uh, yeah, simply just telling the uh, the media gateway what to listen to. Why is that doing that? Uh, what, what to listen to, it's coming in. Uh, likewise, I'm setting up my, my latency value and passphrase, and I can have really as many decoders as I want, uh, or destinations. So in this case, I'm just kind of reflecting it, and I'm sending it back to the, to the decoder over here. That's a good question. Uh, I'll have to look at the, I'll have to real-time uh, troubleshooting here. So let's see. So everything's fine on the video encoder here. Three hundred megabit. Did I fix it? Okay. I started and stopped it. No, I didn't have to reboot. I had to start and stop it. Um, that's right. So, where was I with the. Yeah, so I just wanted to say, yeah, so we have, and we have a, a 1RU chassis, so it basically you're taking those blades out and you can put it into, yeah, encoder, decoder in a single 1RU, and you can actually mix and match. It really applies power, so you could have as many encoders or decoders in the six-slot six chassis, but not a single, single blade. Those 
an encoder on the on the mine rig and then the decoder back where the operator is driving it. It's about 120 seconds, milliseconds of latency, and then we remotely control the mining gear so it can operate the rest of the mine. Rig. So that was special heat sink, no moving parts. Yeah, so yeah, no fan, just passively cooled with the with the heat sink. And uh, we uh, developed the Mikito X decoder harsh because the at Wimbledon they wanted to uh, the commentators, there's 120 commentator booths from around the world, and they said we need to have a, you know, they wanted to go IP, they had a traditional coax network, but they said we don't want any fan noise at all, even though, you know, there's, if you look at the bottom of these guys, there's a little small fan, but they didn't, you know, they didn't want that at all, so we actually took our, we weren't planning on coming out with a harsh decoder, but we came out with a harsh decoder because uh, it had yeah, no moving parts, and the commentators could talk really softly about the, you know, the, the match that's going on uh, so yeah, that's uh, just an example of that. So going back to the Mikito encoder, uh, yeah, sending sending the stream up to the Mikito, uh, the media gateway. At the media gateway, I've uh, set on, set my parameters for my coming in, and then as far as destinations, this is where I was saying you could set as many destinations as you want. So if you're in you know, broadcast a, uh, a broadcaster and you want to send it to maybe 300 affiliates, you'll be able to send all the destinations that you want, and each one of them can have its own configurable uh, latency parameter. So maybe some of those affiliate stations have uh, good internet connections, some have some bad. You can set uh, different protocols, uh, different network settings, and different SRT settings on a per uh, per affiliate or per you know destination basis, even different encryption keys. So maybe you know turn off the stream or um, change the key uh, to prevent access. Someone hasn't paid their bill or what have you. You can uh, on a per on a per destination basis be able to set those uh, those parameters. So once I've uh, set that up, even from here we can click on the statistics button. That's what actually I already have uh, running. Yeah, over here. That's what we've been looking at. So as I yeah, unplugged and jiggled things, we can see um, uh, yeah, that being represented here. I turned it off briefly while I was showing that side-by-side uh, -side view, uh, and then turned it back on, and it was uh, restreaming out. Hey, Dave, you want to mention the rendezvous? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so for sure, the, uh, the different SRT comes with a bunch of different flavors, and we, we designed this to allow for, um, make it very easy to traverse firewalls. And why are we doing that? Because right now, if I wanted to, actually, I, I use this mode uh, while setting up here without having to log into the Comcast firewall uh, router and uh, set up port forwarding rules to get back into the network. What I did was I set both as a caller. So both the encoder is pushing a stream out to the media gateway. And so typically from a firewall, you can always uh, actually, you know what? I'll use a slide to prevent that, to, to demonstrate that. You can always uh, call out, right? So firewalls uh, typically allow traffic out, um, but they don't allow traffic back in. So in a case where you have, um, yeah, let's say a, a known firewall on one side, maybe this is your head end, and you have this decoder out in the field, the, uh, traditionally the encoder is pushing to a decoder, but we can actually have the and even without a media gateway, this is just one-to-one, point-to-point. -to -point. You can have the, the decoder make a request out. This is similar to the RTSP protocol where I'm making a request. So the, the, the caller says, hey, encoder, I want to send you a stream. Uh, sorry, what am I saying? <laughs> the decoder says, hey, send me a stream, and the encoder follows suit with that. And what's happened here is that you haven't had to bother the IT department to say, hey, can you port forward uh, traffic coming from my encoder inside? So maybe you're at a hotel venue or you're at some venue where you don't you cannot or don't have the time to work with IT to open up ports on their firewall to let the traffic in, I can send the decoder to say, hey, make a request to the uh, encoder, and the encoder will send, send a stream using that, that port combination. So we're, we're, using, we're making it very easy to traverse firewalls. Another, so that's caller listener, and we've also set up one called rendezvous. So maybe you, you actually have your encoder and your decoder are both behind two unfriendly, unknown firewalls or unfriendly IT departments that, uh, or sl slow moving, uh, slow, yeah, no, it never happens, but slow moving IT departments and you need to get uh, live on the air. Well, you set our rendezvous mode. And what does that do? Is that the encoder makes a, a request out. So the firewalls, you know, they let, they traditionally let requests out. The decoder makes a request out as, as well. And because they're both using the same ports, 
the firewall, we're kind of tricking the firewalls. The firewalls said, hey, uh, traffic went out that port, I'll let traffic coming back in. Just like if you were a PC accessing Google website, then Google's gonna respond back. So because we've tricked the firewalls, we can now then get the video to go, to go right through without ever having to uh, you know, interfere with uh, or ask IT to make connections. So in this case- There's no security in here. Is there security? <laughs> Don't put the firewall weapon. <laughs> right, so, <laughs> Yeah, so similar like how Skype just works, how a connection is just made with GoToMeeting, you know, you, you don't even have to configure any firewall rules. We've done the same thing for sending live low latency video across networks with the encoder decoder. And the media gateway sitting in the middle is doing the same thing. So I made uh, a call out to the media gateway, I made the decoder made a call out, and I didn't have to configure anything on the, the Comcast uh, router firewall. Let's, uh, oops. Yeah, so that's what we see here in the, yeah, in the different modes. You can just set rendezvous, listener, or caller, depending on your configuration and how you want uh, the different, uh, yeah, if you need to get through a firewall or not. Um, that's basically it. So I've set that on there. Uh, media gateway, likewise. Set my different destinations, and yeah, we're off to the races, and the decoder, yeah, so I didn't talk about the decoder. So on the decoder, we kind of start from the reverse, so you set up the stream that you want to uh, tune into. In this case, I've uh, set up, and you can set up as many, kind of think of it as channels, and then you're tuning into one, or in this case, we have a, a dual decoder, so I could be decoding two simultaneous streams, right? So we uh, tell the protocol we want the decoder to listen, uh, to tune into, in this case SRT, and this is what I was talking about, the caller mode, so I'm making a call out to my media gateway and then tricking the Comcast firewall to let me back in, uh, set the passphrase and the latency that I want. Uh, I can actually even flip the stream, so I'm backhauling it across the network point to point with SRT, and then I can actually flip it to transport stream, and I, this could be a, a unicast or a multicast address, and so we're actually backhauling across the internet and then flipping to UDP. So you could bring this into maybe third-party utilities or even just tune in with VLC or uh, you know, the DCM, whatever you want, you can actually flip it. So not only is it coming out baseband, SDI, but also uh, transport stream as well. Uh, once I've done that, I simply select the interface that I'm interested in tuning into, in this case, and the channel that I want, this the reflected street from Montreal, I'm coming, and then as soon as I hit apply, these uh, fields auto-populate with the resolution, the frame rate, the protocol that's coming in, and, uh, and that's it. The, the decoder itself can downscale and deinterlace, so we could use the downscale and deinterlacer on the, on the decoder if we so choose. Otherwise, we'll output the 1080i signal that's, that's coming in. Um, I'll flip to the live camera, I and mean, we have a live camera right here. So um, I'll just go over here, put it to PNC2, apply. Yeah, this is actually going, yeah, this is going up and coming back down. So all I did was just on the encoder, decoder, set it. We can see the one. So again, that, that sub-second, that latency that we're having and going over the public internet, back up and back down. And it looks pretty damn good. So you have both streams going up and down. No, right just now? one. That's why I just flipped. That's why I just flipped the inter in okay. the interface. So okay. yeah, I could be streaming from both interfaces, but we just don't have the bandwidth here. Right. So you guys can come up and see if you want to see the close up. If you want to see the videos quality, but that's, uh, you, know, you saw it before with the QVC uh, image, and this is, uh, you can see the latency of it going up and back down, uh, actually cross country, international, and coming back down to the decoder here. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. So that's what we wanted to show.
certainly open for questions, comments, you know, discussions afterwards. Uh, we really want to just impress the point that moving video from point A to point B, whether you're going to be doing it over a private network or a public network, Demand is going to come. If you're not seeing it already, you're going to see it. So there's a number of solutions to do it, and for different ways. And we offer a, a less expensive alternative to clients to be able to do what we call the dinner. There's certainly a lot of reasons why you may want to use a private network or satellite, but for clients that can use an alternative like the internet, if they have enough bandwidth, it's a very cost effective solution to do it. But of course, they'll also work with also private and so on. When you're using it with, uh, you mentioned announcers at home. Sure. Uh, if they're doing interviews, it's it's two way, yep. and that, but that latency seems to work okay. They can hear and respond, and yep. it looks like they're real. Time. Sure. I mean, traditionally, people are in, uh, used to going over satellite links, where sometimes there's. You know, one second or plus, oh, yeah. plus one, two, three seconds, and you can see sometimes the commentator is, sit there, yeah, sitting there, and then they and then they go in. So this should really this, be this better. is this is way better. I mean, yeah. yeah, this is you know you can do an interactive, so you have encoder decoder at both sides, and you're, you know, you're getting it in half a second, uh, even sub second, uh, well sub half, you know, less than 500 milliseconds, and going back, and that's you know much better than what they're used to going over satellite for sure, over traditional satellite. Yeah, we've been doing that for a number of years. Uh, a couple of the major sporting sporting venues and sporting, I guess, leagues have been using our solutions for interviewing players. The, actually, the Big Ten just signed on last year where we're doing uh, encoders, decoders in all the Big Ten football stadiums and then Big Ten broadcast headquarters. It's not my client's so exactly what it is. But they have a stack of encoders and decoders and doing exactly that. And they're doing the players and coaches in the practice facilities or the stadiums from the talent back in Big Ten headquarters. We've been doing that with the NFL for years too. Yeah, so MLB, NFL, uh, Azuro use our solution. So they're using our high vision encoders, decoders to be able to put the uh, basically this encode, decode at the NFL practice facilities. And they're sending it all back to Culver City where NFL TV is running the, the interactive uh, interview. And they've been doing that for, yeah, I don't know, five years or so. And then just most recently, NFL had a, they wanted, well, for the last season, they wanted to do the remote replay uh, consultation. So all the, all the stadiums, the 31 stadiums, taking that video, um, oh, that's my laptop, taking that video and having the head of officiating in NFL headquarters be able to watch, uh, consult, look at the play, review the replay, and when the referee, even before the referee gets under the hood, they've already reviewed that video a number of times um, uh, and so that they can basically speed up the gameplay because that was the, the problem that they were having, that the games were running too, low, too long, maybe going, cutting into 60 minutes or what have you. Or ed, they wanted to lower the, uh, reduce, the, re reduce the time of the, of the NFL games, and they're using, they did a shootout of Everts and Cisco Atem uh, with the High Vision Makito X encoder decoder uh, to be able to back all that video from the stadiums uh, back to NFL headquarters and they chose the Makito X product just for its low latency, ability to go over the public internet, um, and, and great quality at, at low bit rates. And there's no way to run any kind of uh, control information across? It's strictly just the audio and the video, right? uh, What type of control information are you thinking? Well, I don't know if they um, wanted to remotely control part of their stuff with like an IP interface or uh, USB, remote USB is sure. something. That, right. Are there any, there's nothing else that goes across? Well, so right now, I mean, in that, so right, to answer it, SRT itself doesn't care about the, uh, whether it's a transport stream in there or um, some other protocol. Right now, we've developed SRT point, uh, for the, yeah, for our streams. But definitely, future down the road, we could jam whatever other, other, once it's IP, into that same SRT. Um, um, bundle as well. So right now, I mean, the transport stream itself has video, audio, and metadata. So anything coming off the SDI bank, I mean, you could right now technically do it by, if you put in that control data into the bank, into the ver vertical ancillary data, um, and then on the, other, on the other end, extract that SDI uh, metadata, you'd be able to then control stuff. So it could be done now if you put it into 
uh, SDI. And if you wanted to just use, uh, use the existing IP, that would be like, say, under a future, a future implementation. Yeah, so, so say you're not using SRT here and you're going point to point. Your latency would be, say, 150 millisecond encode time. So as soon as we're you know, getting that SDI uncompressed video and hitting the wire is 150 milliseconds, then you'd have whatever the network is introducing. So let's say this is uh, Westchester to LA. Let's say it's uh, 100 milliseconds or 50, let's say 50 milliseconds. So now we're up to 200. And then the decode time, uh, so without SRT, decode time is 15 milliseconds. It's very quick. So we're, you know, let's just say 50. So we're at um, 150 plus 50, 200 and 250. Is it coming out uncompressed? Once you do the SRT piece, we're simply adding on a little more on the decoder side. So whatever you're adding, whatever we set that latency value to. So if we set it to 200 milliseconds, then now we're up to, you know, uh, 450. But that would remain consistent yeah. all the time. Not exactly. Exactly. There was a, you know, we're definitely lowering the barrier entry to be able to provide high quality video really, yeah, virtually anywhere, whether it's, yeah, interactive, multi-point aggregation, multi-point distribution, it, you know, all you need, yeah, public internet lines, which are much cheaper, be able to deliver that low latency, high quality video. Back to this. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you.